You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich. Nihau. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 4, page 36. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. That's right. And that's R O T. And I'm Announcer Man. Hey, Announcer Man just joined in. How about that? Hey, Announcer Man, we'll let you know when we need you. Uh huh. Just stand in the corner, please. No! Usually he heads straight out for a smoke break as soon as he finishes the intro. That's. In- oh, he's gone already for oh. the smoke break. Oh, well. Those things will kill you with any luck. You're mocking me, aren't you? He didn't, never actually listens to uh, our show, does he? No. <laughs> Good. I'll continue to speak my mind. Oh, uh, by the way, what's today's episode? Today's episode is Revolving Door by Pete Tuzinski. Peter Tuzinski writes because none of the therapy sessions or pills have managed to make him stop yet, although his family has high hopes for the electroshock. He is married to a very patient woman, he chases a very chaotic toddler, and he is far more likely to read a book than he is to comb his hair. When he isn't haunting the previously tidy halls of Doonstief, he can be found contributing book reviews and articles at sfsignal.com. And he is also writing a Pulp Fiction War serial called Rocket Johnny, which can be found at www.midnightreading.com slash rocket. Also, today's music is All Around by Wilson Noble. Check out the uh, show notes for links to all those. Revolving Door by Peter Tuzinski. All Careful now, don't you make a sound. I have a friend named Lori, and she runs a writer's colony. Once a year, six writers are selected. They come out and wander free as the wind blows with no outside obligations. It's nice. It's also like a religious cult, only with no guns and possibly creepier people. There are seven people this year, and one of them's me. I'm not a writing student, about 15 years too deep into a career for that. But Lori's an old friend, and when she asks me to come out and help, she knows me too well to buy any of my excuses, so here I am. To set the scene, it's the last night of the two-week retreat. There are six riders, there is Lori, and we are sitting on logs around a campfire, as is traditional on the last night of every year. We roast marshmallows, try not to set the Nevada desert or each other on fire. We talk. One year, we had a guy who played a guitar, and that was a lot of fun. Another year, we had a guy who played the oboe, and that was significantly less fun. Also with us is one R. Norman Harrison. And he's here every year as well, though whether or not he participates is another matter. He's a well-off and well-known writer of literary fiction. Like a slightly lunatic John Updike, if you want to make comparisons. It's his property, you see. He lives in a big old house, out here in the middle of the Nevada desert, almost six miles away from the nearest town. He paid for the six cabins that the writers stay in. Mostly he doesn't get involved, just lets Lori do it. Probably it's a tax write-off. I have no idea. It's rare that he comes out with us, though. Most years he doesn't. I've been here three separate years, and he's never been out here. The colony's been going for almost ten years, and Lori says he's only been out a couple of times. Where the rest of us sit on logs around the fire, Mr. Harrison sits in a cheap lawn chair. A sort that's made of aluminum and cheap strips of bright blue rubber. He's nearly 70 now, and although he's in pretty good health, as writers tend to be when they aren't in the middle of writing a series of books. Healthy knees don't like getting down on logs at his age. Come to that. Neither do mine. But never mind that. The seven of us are all talking. One of the writers finished her novel, and she's jubilant about it. Another writer wrote 12,000 words on her project, and then deleted 16,000. She's less thrilled. 
Still, it's the last night. It's a beautiful summer evening around a big fire that smells like hickory in autumn and crackles. The sky is clear, and in Nevada, that means a whole universe of stars lay themselves bare for you to see. It's hard to be anything but happy on a night like that. Admittedly, there are beers, and I've had three, and that might bias me a little. Even Norman Harrison is smiling in his quiet and shy sort of way. The conversation comes back to me. There is a pause because I've just put a marshmallow in my mouth without blowing on it first. So instead of answering anyone, I'm trying not to scald my tongue. For a moment, there is only the sound of the fire snapping and talking to itself. Before I finish negotiating the hot marshmallow, Norman speaks up. He says, I have a story I want to tell. The riders just look at him placidly. I look at Lori, who looks at me. There's a bit of surprise on our faces. Actually, there's a lot of surprise. The riders don't know it, but this is practically unheard of. I would have spoken to urge Norman onward, but my mouth is pretty much out of service. Fortunately, Lori jumped in. She says, Sure, Norman, we'd be glad to hear it. Okay. Norman says. He takes a drink of something from his mug. It's not beer. I think it might just be apple cider. Then he stares into the mug for a long moment. As if we aren't here. Then he speaks. My story takes place in 1945, which was the year I bought this house. It's a true story. All stories are true when you get to their hearts. This one's no different. Norman pauses, and for a moment, I think he's going to change his mind and not say anything else. But he keeps going. It was a pretty summer night, just like this one. And I was traveling from Reno to Las Vegas. Across this very stretch of road in my old Chevy. I don't have that car anymore. Um, obviously. Actually, I wasn't driving. Me and uh, one of my friends, Paul, his name was Paul, had uh, had a bit to drink. But we weren't drunk, mind you, just a bit buzzed. Another good friend of mine, Michael, was driving the car. Norman looks down at his mug right then and says, That was the last time I drank beer. There's silence. Even the fire seems to quiet down, like it's listening. Norman goes on. We are pretty close to Reno and Sparks, and it's nearly the middle of the night, and of course that means that one of the tires finds out. It's less of a problem at night, in the desert. A huge problem in the daytime. Even these days you see shredded corpses of burned-out tires on the side of the road where they flared and ripped themselves off the rim. The tires on the Chevy were old. This one was obviously oldest of all. Thank God that Michael was driving. He was a good driver, and he was sober, and he kept the car under control. Something that a lot of people don't do properly. Got her speed down, kept her straight. Got her off the side of the road, got her stopped. There are places out here where the side of the road is nothing but a cliff. Thank God we were in a flat area. Clearest memory of my life. Norman continues after he pauses to lick his lips. We all got out of the car. Shit was the first thing I said. It was also the second thing I said. When you're stranded in the middle of a Nevada highway, the odds of someone else passing you are pretty slim. This was before cell phones, so we couldn't call for help. We didn't know exactly how far away from Reno we were, and walking through Nevada desert isn't the best idea, day or night. There are still coyotes out here. Snakes. Things that come out during the night. Do you have a spare? Paul asked. He fumbled the trunk open and shuffled around the stuff that was back there. Then he shouted, Why the hell don't you have a spare, Norman? That was the spare, I said. I remember that struck me as hugely funny, and I laughed about it. Here we were, trapped in some sort of weirdo Abbott and Costello routine. Paul was less amused. He was shouting and waving his arms, and he wanted to hit me. I, I know he wanted to hit me, because he said, very loudly, I want to hit you. He'd had several more beers than me. Mostly Paul's a happy drunk. Not that night, though, and I guess I didn't blame him. Come on, calm down, Michael said. Michael would have been level-headed during a nuclear apocalypse. He was just that sort of guy. He stood between me and Paul, and he said, Look, there was a house half a mile back on the road. Didn't see a house, Paul snapped. You were slumped in the footwell, chortling among the beer cans, Michael pointed out. But it was there. So we'll walk out, see if we can phone a tow truck. 
I'm not leaving the car to go wandering in the desert, Paul said. Norman pauses, and then he looks up at us, and he says, I want you guys to know. Paul was the best friend you could have, okay? I, I know how he sounds. He sounds like a child throwing a fit. It was the beers, mostly, and being stranded in the desert like that. And I, I don't know if any of you have ever had a flare-out on a tire, but it's loud and, and turbulent and scary. We were, all of us, jacked up on adrenaline. We all nod to show that we understand. Paul was not a bad guy. Norman takes a drink of cider, then he sets the now-empty cup down. He laces all of his thick fingers together and looks down at his knuckles. So Michael points out that he's not going to leave Paul, who's behaving like an idiot alone at the car. And Paul says he doesn't need a damn parent, and Michael says he's sure acting like he does. Finally, I said, look, I'll just walk the half mile back, okay? You guys can stay put. No sense of the three of us wandering around the Nevada desert. The car battery's fine, so keep the lights on so I can see it on my way back. It'll let me walk the beer off. Paul agreed. Michael agreed. I put on a jacket and I headed off down the road. Something among the wood and the fire makes a loud pop and we all jump a little. Norman included. When he jumps, he looks back at his house. It's something like an old Victorian-style home, which is strange in the middle of the desert. Like something the Adams family would have loved. He looks back, says, So I, I headed off down the road. I was in good shape. I should have been. I was a lot younger. And the cold air kept me awake and moving quickly. The desert isn't a warm place at night. But you know that. You've been here two weeks. You're all sitting around a fire. The house was there, half a mile or so down the road, just like Michael thought it had been. The man could probably draw a map of the whole entire route we took, miles around the road, just from memory. But that sounds like bragging, but it really isn't. Michael noticed everything. When I wrote my first short stories, uh, this was just after a few of them sold, I always showed them to him. He spotted things no one else would. Weird, obscure things. Damn useful friend, Michael. All the house's windows were dark, and that was no surprise. It was the middle of the damn night, and there isn't much of a party scene in the middle of the Nevada desert. I felt bad as I walked off the road's shoulder and headed toward the house. It didn't have a driveway of any sort, so I trekked across a patch of scraggly ground covered in long grass and sagebrush. For a few moments, my feeling bad took a back seat to my hoping not to get stung to death by some angry nighttime creature. The house had a wraparound porch like the sort that should have had a porch swing on it or an old black man from Mississippi playing a banjo. If that's a cliché, it's because it was that sort of house, that sort of wraparound porch. I went up the steps. I hesitated only a moment, and then I rapped hard on the house's big wooden door. Whoever I woke up would probably be in a less than charitable mood, but what could I do? Sitting out on the road and waiting for someone to pass us would leave us out here for days. There were no lights on in any of the windows, and minutes after my knock, there were still no lights on in any of the windows. Instead of with two knuckles, I hit the door frame with my whole hand, and it rattled much louder. Norman raises his fist and shows us how he knocked, and it is indeed with the side of his fist. I hit it with my fist three times. I remember that really clear, because just as the third hit landed, the door opened. Thank God I didn't go for a fourth hit. I would have knocked the house's owner in the face. Norman stops and swallows visibly, and suddenly he looks uncomfortable. He's a ruddy old man, but he looks a little pale. We are all in rapt attention, of course. There are bottles of beer going to waste. The fire could run down, and, and we wouldn't notice in time. Certainly no one's spearing and eating marshmallows anymore. We're just listening. Like kids at a story hour, just like that, we practically have our knees drawn up. Norman continues, quieter now. The... the house owner. He was a tall, bald man, really thin, not unhealthy, not starved. Just one of those people who can eat fried chicken for breakfast, lunch, and dinner without gaining any particular body weight. Even in the dark night, and with no particular light except the near full moon, I could see his eyes. They were big, and they were unblinking, and I i don't know if I noticed that until later. I, Norman swallows again. It's hard to talk about. 
One of the riders around the fire says, You don't have to. But he stops when Laurie puts a hand on his knee. Norman doesn't even seem to notice. He's a million miles away, or several decades back. Norman continues. He didn't say anything, just looked at me. I smiled at him and said, Sorry to wake you, mister, but my car has lost a tire about a mile up the road. Wondered if you had a telephone I could use to call a truck. The house owner just stands there, tall and thin and holding the door open with one arm. It was then, in that weird silence, that I realized he wasn't in nighttime clothes of any sort. He wasn't standing there in the altogether, or boxers or nothing. He was wearing a pinstriped suit. Weird, I guess, but so is a house in the middle of the Nevada desert. Finally, I added, quietly, um, can I come in? The house owner answered. He smiled, too wide and full of perfectly straight, perfectly white teeth. He put his other hand on my shoulder and said, Of course, friend, everyone may come in once. Please do. I was cold, it was dark, and we were stranded, and I had asked, so I let him guide me over the threshold of his house. Inside was a small entry room, a place for coats, there were none there, and a place for boots, also none, and another door that led into the rest of the house. I took off my jacket, it seemed polite, hung it up on the rack as he was opening the door that led into the rest of the house, and... Norman stops again. Abruptly, he unlaces his fingers and rubs at his face, holds them over his eyes for a very long moment. Nobody says anything. No one would dare at this point. We sit there, frozen. We stare at him. We wait. We would have waited all damn night. He exhales a huge rattling breath and then drops his hands. He holds his knees, and I think that if we weren't only lit by orange firelight, I would see that his knuckles are bright white from pressure. But I don't know for sure. I'm a writer. I embellish. Probably that's it. He opened the door into the rest of the house when I approached it. Norman says, And he, I, I, you won't believe me, but I swear to God this. He opened the door, and the whole entryway filled with light. It was absolutely blinding after the darkness of the desolate nighttime world. Even before my eyes had adjusted, when all I could see was my own watering tears, veins inside my eyelids, and bright, bright white light, the house owner put his hands on my shoulder again, and he gently pushed me into the room beyond. I was too startled to stop him, so into the next room I went. I rubbed at my eyes and really tried to see, tried to will my pupils to the right size faster. There hadn't been any light outside. I wasn't in a room any longer. I don't know how else to say it, but plainly. And that's it. I wasn't in a house. I wasn't in a desert. I was standing on a beautiful beach. Pure white sand beneath my feet. The ocean water, green as a beautiful girl's eyes, stretched on forever and ever, broken only by gentle surf. The sky was a shade of blue that you cannot imagine that an artist could not paint, that does not possibly exist. The wind was warm and soothing and wrapped itself around me as I stood there and gaped. As I stood there, absolutely stunned, I turned around and, sure enough, there was the old wooden door standing upright all by itself in the middle of the beach. Beyond it were tall, beautiful palm trees. They were too green, too incredibly green. I... There are no words. It was the most beautiful place you have ever seen, ever imagined. It was a dream that you forgot but woke up happy and in love from, nonetheless. Norman rubs his knees. The firelight makes it seem like his eyes are wet. The house owner was still beside me, hands in the pockets of his suit, looking out at the beach. When I turned to look at him, he smiled at me, big and happy and free. It seemed to me that no better a friend had ever existed than him. What is this? I said. Where am I? What's happened? You are somewhere else, he said. Isn't that enough? Sometimes we question too much. 
isn't this nice? Nice, I said, and I laughed. It was strange and alarming. How could you not stand on such a perfect beach on such a perfect day and not laugh out loud at the wind? This is beyond nice. This is... This is the most perfect place that's ever existed. This is incredible. Oh, yes, the house owner said. Look down the beach a little. Do you see that cottage? I looked, and I saw. It was a little log cabin of sorts with a thatch roof and a hammock out front. The house owner nodded toward it, and I walked that way. I desperately wanted to kick off my shoes and squeeze my toes in the sand. Like all good beach sand, it was warm on the top. But if you dig your toes in a little ways, it's cool and damp. There were no rocks on the beach. The sand was like silk. Only my footprints marred it. The cottage door was nothing but a curtain, and the house owner pushed it aside for me. He put his hand on my shoulder and ushered me inside, and I went, willingly. Inside, there was a little wooden table with a little wooden chair. And on the table was the single most beautiful thing you could imagine. Norman looks at all of us for just a moment and says, A classic old royal typewriter. Beautiful machine. In perfect condition. We all nod. Sit down, the house owner says. Why not type something? I sat down, but I wasn't keen to type anything. I'll tell you that straight. The reason we were on this trip to Reno? For a relaxing weekend of rabble-rousing. I'd sold four short stories at that point, but everything was just lying dead on the page. And there's nothing more miserable than being the friend of a writer who's wallowing over crap he can't help but write. So Michael and Paul hauled me off to Reno to relax. But he was compelling, the house owner in his pinstriped suit. And it was a beautiful, beautiful typewriter. So I put two fingers on it and I pressed some keys. I enjoyed the clack, clack, clack of the keys smacking against the sheet of paper. I wrote some words, a piece of a short story that I'd been niggling at before we left. I wrote slow. I'd never used a typewriter that old before. Norman reaches down and picks up his empty apple cider mug. He seems about to try and take a drink from it. Then he just rolls it between his hands. It was perfect. He says quietly. Absolutely perfect. The most perfect few sentences ever. The best, that's all. It was as if I'd finally gotten out of the way and sheer artistic magic was taking place right there on the page. I read it, overjoyed, and I reveled in it as if I had never seen that idea before. I typed 200 words, and when I finished, I was grinning hugely. I don't understand what this is, I said, looking at the house owner. He stood behind my chair, hands on each of my shoulders, and he smiled down at me. I don't understand where I am. I'm sorry. You are happy, said the house owner. I think that's what's best to focus on, isn't it? And you can stay here forever if you like. The beach is yours. The house is yours. The typewriter is yours. There are miracles in the world, Norman Harrison. And this is one of them. Did I want to stay? Of course. I was in love. Hopelessly in love. It was like seeing color for the first time. Like being deaf all your life and then hearing a symphony. But I think it was the beers, those few beers that slowed up my thinking a little bit. And so, as the house owner and I walked out of the little cottage and back onto the beach, which was now unblemished, I said, I, my friends, I have two friends with me. Could they come here too? Of course, said the house owner. And you would have your friends... And you would see them on your beach, and they would see themselves in their own perfect places, with you beside them. That's how this place works. Everyone is happy. I looked around at the beach, and I longed to take off all my clothes and swim in that perfect water. I knew it would be the perfect temperature. The waves wouldn't bother me. Nothing could bother me here. I'll just go get them then, okay? I said and I took a few steps toward the door. I looked back, worried that the house owner would be upset or something, you know. I didn't want him to be angry. I loved him more than anything at that point. He didn't look angry. He just smiled at me and nodded a little and walked me to the door. 
He didn't open it for me this time, but I did that okay. I said, I'll be right back. Swear to God, I'll be right back. He nodded, and I shot out of the house like lightning and tore down the road. The world seemed flat and miserable now, like an empty shell of the world inside that weird, wonderful, perfect house. I ran so fast. I should have been out of breath. I should have been in pain. I felt like I was flying down the side of the road. I have no idea how long it took me to do the half mile. I would say a minute. I came to the car, marked by a pair of red brake lights all alone in the middle of the Nevada desert. Paul was sitting on the trunk, kicking the bumper with his feet. Michael sat on the side of the road. They both got up the moment they saw me. I probably looked like I was being chased or something. I talked, and I talked fast, and I probably talked really incoherent because they just stared at me for a long time. I wasn't breathing hard, but I was breathing fast. I wasn't tired at all. I was 30 miles up, going a thousand miles an hour, trying to shout down at them. But eventually they got the idea. With Paul grousing, which is what Paul did, they accompanied me back the half mile toward the house. We all walked, and that was the hardest part. The absolute hardest part. I wanted to run. Just tear down the road and knock down the door. We approached the house. We cut down the lawn. We stepped up onto the wraparound porch. I was shaking all over. I was barely able to stand still. In fact, I remember that there were tears in my eyes, streaming down my cheeks. I was grinning from ear to ear. Why wouldn't I be? I knocked on the door three times again, but this time I was trembling so bad that it was practically all one blow. I was a human Richter scale. Stand there, I said, and I shoved Michael and Paul in front of the door as the inner door opened. Michael and Paul looked at me, puzzled, and then went inside, one after the other. I paused only a moment to wipe my eyes on my hands, then my hands on my jeans, and then I went inside too. Paul and Michael were gone. The inner door was closed. I could barely grab the handle. I was shaking so hard. I was so weak with excitement. I pulled it open and... Norman stopped speaking. He's crying now. Nothing so open as a sob, but there are tears running down his cheeks, and they are distinct in the firelight. He reaches halfway up to wipe them away, then lowers his hands, which are shaking just as bad as he says they did ages ago. Norman is silent for several minutes, and so are we all. Then he speaks, and it's in a whisper. I open the door and step through into a dark hallway. To my left is an old staircase. To my right is a dusty old living room. Straight ahead is a dark kitchen. Behind me is the entryway to the house, with my coat still hanging on the rack. A floorboard creaks under my feet and the wind whistles, cold and lonely, across the wraparound porch and through the open doorway. There was no other sound. There was no Paul, no Michael. There was nothing but a big, old, empty, silent, dusty, dark house. And me. I realize right then that I'm crying too. I don't notice until a tear drips off my cheek and lands on the back of my hand, cold and wet, and it shocks me into looking down at it. I stare at it, and it sits there, and I just stare. Norman continues to speak, and his voice gets a little stronger. He speaks a little faster. He says, I, I searched the house, of course, but there was no one there at all. The house looked like it had been empty for years and years. There wasn't even a telephone. I sat down on the floor in the entryway next to my coat and I sobbed. I don't know how long I sat there crying but it seemed like forever. I know that eventually when I was able to breathe when I was able to stop and able to move again I went outside and the eastern sky was starting to lighten a little. I walked back to my Chevy sitting by the side of the road missing a tire Last time, it took me a minute to sprint there. This time, it probably took me half an hour to trudge. 
My feet were lead weights and I didn't care to find the strength to move them. When I got there, a state patrol car was sitting beside my own. The officer had been jotting down my license plate number to report an abandoned car, and when he saw me, he approached. He asked questions, sharp and suspicious, and I answered, quiet and hollow. Eventually, he gave me a ride back into Reno, and even called a tow truck and a repair shop and got my car taken care of. Norman reaches up and wipes his eyes. He looks down at his fingertips and then closes them into a fist. And that's my story. He says. And I'm... I'm going to bed now. I'm sorry to talk so much. I'm... He hesitates. Good night. We all sit and stare as he stands up and heads back to his house. Just a little distance off. We are still staring at his chair, even several minutes after he's gone. I don't know how much time has passed, and I don't care. None of us do. In the middle of us all, the fire crackles and snaps. Above us, the stars spin through their courses. On the logs, we are silent, and we are still. The next morning, I head up to the house. Everyone is packing up. Everyone is getting ready to make their way back to their lives and their families and their hustle and bustle, myself included. But before I go, I want to say goodbye to Norman Harrison, with whom I had never exchanged more than a handful of words. I go up to his wraparound porch, and I hesitate when I realize the front door is open, shifting gently back and forth in the dry morning breeze. The curtains on the inside of it blow around, little white banners. I open the door a little wider and I call his name, but there's no answer. Hesitantly, I go into the entryway of the house and I look around through the inner door, which is also open. I don't see him at all. I don't hear him anywhere. And in an old house, every movement of a man his size creaks a floorboard somewhere. I turn to go back outside to see if he's talking to Lori or someone. And I notice his coat rack. It's empty. I realize I'm smiling as I go back onto the porch. And I know that I'll be smiling all day. I'm crying too, again, but I don't mind. I don't wipe away the tears. What I am very careful to do before I head down to my car is to shut the door firmly. Author's Note Hello, my name is Peter Tosinski, and the story you've just heard, The Walking Door, was written in an instant messenger chat window. A friend of mine who I was talking to went away to make dinner or empty the dishwasher or something. And faced with the possibility of having to do some real work that somebody was expecting, I clicked on the italics key in the chat window, and I started typing a story that hadn't been there before and for which I had no ending. It took me about five, maybe ten minutes to finish the whole thing. And when it was done, it was more or less the story that you've just heard. This is very similar to what Harlan Ellison has been doing for years, when he'll sit in a bookshop window and be given a title or the first word, and just type the story, page by page, posting them in the windows for people to read. It's very much the same thing, except on a smaller scale, and just for fun, just for venting. I've done it maybe a dozen times, and I'll probably continue to do it. And I hope you've really enjoyed its product, the, the story you've just heard. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the story. Someday you're going to switch that up, aren't you? But we don't know what episode it's going to be. But someday you're going to say something different. So that's why everyone must pay attention. You're shaking your head. It's not easy for me to come up with new material.
I'm going to get a guest host to say it for me, maybe. Wait, you'll bring a guest all the way in here only to have them say word yeah. for word what you always say. And then we'll say, thanks. See you later. Say, ladies and gentlemen, that was Steve Ely from Skate Pod. Thanks for your contribution. I uh, am a big fan of this story. Okay. Revolving Door. I read it before you. Where... You keep doing that. What is this? It was one of my New Year's resolutions. Yeah, but people don't keep New Year's resolutions. We said this podcast was going to be good as part of our New Year's resolution, too. We didn't do that. I have no knowledge of ever promising that this would be good. No, this was one that I read and forwarded on to you. I just remember hearing it in my head as I was reading it. I thought, wow, I can even see how we would perform this story. Do we dare say perform? I suppose so. Well, you, you know, can I, do every, a bad performance as well as a good every one. Every once in a while, I'll pick up an audio book. Like, okay, I saw uh, Slaughterhouse Five today, and on the back it says, Performed by Ethan Hawke. And I thought, oh no, performed? Is that some kind of ab- abridgment where we don't go through <laughs> everything? And I looked and it said, Unabridged on six CDs. Performed is probably the same as read by, only. It's read with feeling. Well, I think then we perform our stories then. We do voices, we do characters, yeah. do sound effects. No, Anyhow. We even do our own sound effects sometimes. Screaming and laughing and so forth. That's actually us. So as I was saying, I, I could imagine <laughs> in my head how we would do this with you reading the present tense stuff and me reading the past tense stuff. And, and I, mean, I think this is the first one besides Uberman where we've just had the two narrators, basically. Yeah, it was as if... Pete Tuzinski had written this story for us, where it's just like two readers, and that's pretty much all you need. Yeah, so this was good. one we were able to get done really quickly. And usually the more characters there are, the more voices we have to keep straight, more people we have to bring in to help us, the longer it's going to take yeah. to edit, right? Maybe I should eliminate all that I have just said and simply say, this story was moving to me. This story was really interesting. You know, I would say that my favorite kind of story is a story within a story. Uh I'd say about half of my work (laughs) has a story within a story. I love, tell me a story, Grandpa, or, oh, that reminds me of something that happened to me. Or it's like, on a night just like tonight, you know, kind of thing (laughs) within a story. Love that. That's a very tried and true tradition, the whole story within a story thing. I bet there's, there could be a whole subgenre of stories within stories. Did you ever read Different Seasons by Stephen King? The fourth story in that is The Breathing Method, and it's the only one that's not been made into a movie. You'd have to remind me what The Breathing Method's about, though. I don't remember. Well, basically, he sets up a club where some elderly men meet together, and then each week it's somebody's turn to tell a story. And usually they're quite frightening stories. And it's very similar to in Ghost Story by Peter Straub, the Chowder Society, how they would meet every single week and tell a ghost story. It was, you know, I can't wait to hear what you have to say next week when it's your turn. And in The Breathing Method, most of that story is being told by one of the members for his week. And then in Skeleton Crew, which was one of his short story collections, he did another story set in this same club where it was another person's turn to tell the story. And it was much shorter. It's a story called The Man Who Would Not Shake Hands. And it's set in this exact same environment with just somebody anew telling a story. And, oh, I just loved that. And I always expected that he would do more because Uh there were like five or six men that would sit around smoking their pipes or cigars or whatever men do. I'm not one yet, so I don't know, around a fire and they would tell a story. what announcer man's doing outside right now. You know, that follows him wherever he goes, the funk of that cigar. (laughs) Cigar, it's a pipe. Oh, well, it's quite a lovely smell, sir. (laughs) But I always expected Stephen King to write more in that series and, and as far as i know he never did well, he was killed by that, yeah, <laughs> that van in 99 van. who knows it's what he might have write done. more he might have finished the dark tower series i mean that would have been cool to have seen the end of it uh, you know that's one of those things where we got to talk about that forever what might have happened well it's like that wheel of time series that never got finished they, uh, they were going to bring somebody else in to finish the last book yeah last I, i've books. heard that that's turned into a trilogy now the last book oh that's great. become like 40 gazillion words when you think about it that's par for the course for, for that, that whole series. series because that series should have been over in like seven or eight books and they're on like 11 or 12 now and now he's dead would have been so much better if he just cut out a whole lot of the fat because my goodness were those fat books you could read an entire 700 page book and the first thing that actually happens was what he ended the book on oh man so you you're saying that robert jordan's wheel of time series is flabbier than king's dark tower series oh yeah definitely wow King's Dark Tower series is seven books, right? Yeah, seven books in so, a novella. Not even close. 
Seven books, Robert Jordan was just getting started, and all the books are at least 600 pages long. Yes, but I'm talking about flab. I'm talking about body fat. Oh, there is that flab should be like lost. nobody's business. No, seriously, dude, Wheel of Time is like the Louis Anderson of literary fiction. <laughs> You know, the the thing is, it's interesting stuff. And I, I think you could say that about Stephen King's Dark Tower series. It's got interesting stuff in there. It may not be moving the story along, but it's not slit your wrist kind of uh, material. It's not like reading a Stephanie Meyer book or something where there's fluff in there that's just completely worthless. But Well, I don't know. I, Wastelands and Drawing of the Three, uh, and those, those are like middleweight boxing. The Oscar de la Hoya's. Of the, the literary genre uh -huh. right there, you know. I mean, there's, not a, there's not even an ounce of fat on those guys. And The Gunslinger, the first book, is like flyweight or <laughs> getting two Ethiopians fighting over a bowl of rice. <laughs> I mean, that book should be expensive. Oh, gosh. I have to cut that, right? <laughs> well, I'm going to leave that in because it's funny. But that's just like that. That, that book should be twice the length that it is. There's you know, so much stuff that happens in that book. You know, it's funny, the whole Ethiopians thing. Is that a specifically our age thing? Because it was in the 80s that Ethiopia was in desperate straits. Now, you don't hear about Ethiopia like that. No, now it's Somalia, right? Yeah, Somalia, and there's even there's other places as well. Anyways, back to where we were. Bantamweights. But, uh, you know, like I said, still interesting stuff, but holy crap. I mean, there's one book. They go the entirety of the book, and the first thing that actually happens is the last page. Someone gets captured. That's the first thing that actually happens in the story. Well, so if Jordan had known that he was going to die, he probably would have skipped that book altogether, right? I don't know. See, I think he knew even by this time that he had cancer and that the clock was ticking. I don't understand. I've read people's reviews and stuff, and everybody just complains about, why did you not get on with it? Are you in love with the money that you get from these books? And so you just figure, string them out as long as you can, or what it was? I don't know, but just a shame, you know, when someone's got a massive series. And it was like the whole Harry Potter crap that Rowling says, hey, I've got the last chapter or whatever of Harry Potter already written. So that coda same. at the end of book seven with the future, where we talk about when Harry and all them grow up, that was all written way back when she first started. That's the chapter she's talking about? I don't think about? that's the one she's talking about. I think it was the final battle with Voldemort or whatever. You heard that, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Same deal that they said about Robert Jordan is that he had his finale ready to go, written, and he's got it all ready, and he's just trying to get his characters to that place. And I just thought, God, really? Well, I've done that in stories before. How about you? Yeah, I've done that. A lot of the times I'll outline it out so that it'll come out the way I want to, which the weirdest thing is the one time that I really did that, I got to the end of the story and I'm like, crap, that's not right. So I reworked the ending. Crap, that's not right either. And I reworked it again. In, in what way was it not right? <laughs> it just didn't give the right feeling, the feeling that I was after. I still, I don't know. I think I finally was satisfied with that story. But if I was to go and read it again, I may find that I still haven't quite achieved what I was after. Well, we were going to talk about a little bit about writing in this episode. So uh, maybe we'll do all of our technical stuff that we have to get out of the way and then we'll talk about writing some more. But I've had a lot of teachers, professors, Stephen King's say that there's nothing lazier than writing an outline for your story because it doesn't leave room for creativity or what's the point in writing it if you already know where it's going to go and, and all these strange opinions that I don't share. Yeah, I because don't either. with a... me, I, it's so difficult for me to actually write to the end. I don't have the wherewithal. Is that the word? Uh, is that a word? It is a word. To plug through to the very end and, and, and keep on sweating until I get to the end. Uh -huh. So having an outline or, or knowing where I want to go sometimes helps me because I can skip ahead to a part where, oh, okay, I, I know I want to have a part where they fight. And I can skip ahead to that part when I get stuck or when I have to do some research and I don't want to do that. You, you know what I mean? Because there are certain parts of writing that are more fun than others. Yeah. You know, that's a good idea. I may have to try that sometime. That might help. According to some, that's not creative, or that's stifling, or that's limiting, or that's just bad practice. 
But for me, it's very necessary. And in, maybe in another podcast, when we're talking about writing, I'll tell you examples of what happened in this particular class where I had a professor who, who just, he had a certain way that people are supposed to write. And he would make us write in that way. And it was completely the opposite of how I normally write. And uh, it, it's an interesting topic. We, maybe we'll talk about it again. But basically, the other day, I told you about I was driving home from a friend's house. And I started to think about this story that I had read once. <laughs> and I, I couldn't remember if it was a story or a movie. Obviously, it wasn't a movie. or I would remember what it was. I was thinking, oh, it must have been an episode of the new Twilight Zone because it had to have been within like the last two or three years. And then I thought, no, that new Twilight Zone, that absolute piece of crap, new Twilight Zone was like 2001, 2002. So, so it was way back there. What was this idea? And I got home and I realized it was something I had written. And so I opened up the document and I started reading through and thinking, wow, I, I wrote this and I'd forgotten that I... I get to the end and it's not there. It just ends like in mid-sentence. And I had not <laughs> outlined it. I have no idea where I was going in 2006 when I wrote it or 2007, whenever it was. It just ends. It's funny when you started telling me about that story. I knew what story it was right away, sadly. I knew exactly which one you were talking about. You're like, yeah, it was that idea where the woman wakes up and says stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's... If you had been in the car with me at that moment, you could have said, that wasn't the Twilight Zone, that was you! Uh, yeah, I remembered your story better than you did. I never did know where you were going with it, though, so I can't help you out, sorry. You know, maybe we'll kick around different philosophies about writing and different practices. Because lots of people do it different ways, and that doesn't mean that one person is wrong. That's or right. That Every, I mean, there are ways to do it, and everybody has their own way, I think, and you have to find the way that works for you and go with that. And it doesn't do you any good to learn somebody else's way if it doesn't work for you, and then you try and force yourself, and of course you're never going to achieve anything that way. See there, you've saved us the trouble of having to tell you what happened when I tried to write like our professor forced us. <laughs> anyway, we'll talk more about writing in just a couple minutes. Thank you, Pete for sending us this story. He, this was the second story he had sent us. Yes, that's right. What he, was the first story he sent us? Uh, <laughs> oh, that was one of my favorites. As a kid, I would ask my mom to read that for me, and, and she never would, <laughs> and I never understood why. And But now, now that I can smell it... Now, the first story that he wrote was Into Silence Like a Shout, which, if you recall, was about the... Uh, there are no dwarf women! That's right. <laughs> the moon so slowly settling down and crushing the world to bits. I loved that story. That was a good one, yeah. I think this is a talented guy. Pete, if you're listening, thank you for sticking around. And also, yeah, you, you got some good stuff. So Pete is the newest of our repeat performances. <laughs> Pete and repeat, we're in a boat. Pete jumped out. Who is left? Repeat? Pete and repeat, we're in a boat. <laughs> That's so good. We are glad that he came back because we like his stuff. We're glad that he's slumming it again with us. Yeah, thanks, man. Now, have <laughs> we had a three-time champion, whatever you want to call it? A triple threat? <laughs> Not quite yet. But we've but got one on the way, right? There are a couple on the way. Is triple threat a good way to describe Not that? Not really, no. Triple threat is what you call like Guy someone who can play that basketball, can, right. baseball, and he can also mow a lawn. Right, or like an actress that's an actress and a model and a singer or whatever. That's your triple threat. It's like Paris Hilton is an actress, a socialite, and a whore. There you go. Perfect. Well, I don't know. I, that, I shouldn't say that. She's not an actress. If you've seen anything she's been in. If people will donate, I'll tell my Paris Hilton story. You'll tell us about how you were dressed as Lucky the Leprechaun? I could. <laughs> if you would like to be a repeat or a <laughs> single performer, if you would like to send us a story for the Doonstief Audio Fiction magazine, all you got to do is head on over to www.doonstief.com, take a look at the submission guidelines and see what we're after, and then send that story to submissions at doonstief.com. Cool. We have a team now that read through our stories with us, uh -huh. which has been great. Yes. In fact, we can always use more readers. If you would like to be a co-editor, send Big an email at editor at doonstief.com and just mention that you'd like to volunteer to read some of the stories and give feedback and help us get through that folder. That's right. We do have some great people that have helped us out, but we can use more. And yep. I think there have been some that have burned out, right? <laughs> We're like, here, read the following 13 stories by Wednesday. And we've never heard from them again. 
Yeah, well, I'm kind of burned out, too. That's why I let you read every story first now. <laughs> well, you have other things that you do. You have responsibilities that no. would make me quail in apprehension. <laughs> But yeah, if you'd like to become a part of that, we could always use people who would like to read lines for the stories. We like to uh, try and get different people um, reading the different characters as much as possible. So if you're interested in that, if you're interested in volunteering in any way, even if you have a, a special idea of your own that we haven't mentioned, just drop us a line at editor at doonsteve.com. Two other things. Music. We can always use music if you're willing to create some kind of song that we can use either for our episode or for the story or for our outros. And also, our listener Rick did artwork for last week's episode, Aqualung. And I was thinking, okay, I got to admit, it, I wasn't thinking at all. I was just drooling and farting in the corner. You were thinking that every single episode we should have artwork for. Yeah. Every single story and... That would be great, but it's beyond my ken. <laughs> or Barbie. Uh. Yeah, so if you're <laughs> <laughs> so if you're interested in that, you know, drop us a line. That would be really cool. And uh, Rick made us another uh, picture this week around, so we're really excited about that. So yeah, another way that you could help us out, if, uh, you know, you don't have the time to put in to reading stories or, or whatever, we always need donations. We do pay our authors, and uh, we'd like to pay them more. And the only way that that could happen is through listener donations. So if you feel... That feeling of compassion, charity, welling up in the bottom of your heart, then please press the button. Yeah, that would be cool. My uncle used to always say that his time was more valuable than his money. Now, he was a multimillionaire, <laughs> but he would always say that, and I didn't get it. Like when I was a teenager, he'd say, I'll give you $20 to wash my truck. And I'd be like, whoop. We can take it to the car wash for $6 and that. And he would say, yeah, but my time is more valuable than money. So you took the $20, drove it to the car wash, washed it for 6 I don't think Kept he would trust me with his truck. <laughs> it would be nice if people press the button. And uh, if they're not able to do that, refer us to a friend. Refer? Mention, recommend. Recommend us to a friend. You can yeah. mention us in your blog. You can add us as a friend on Facebook or you MySpace. Make a review of us on iTunes or Podcast Pickle. Really? Podcast Pickle has us on there? I think so. And maybe even Podcast Alley. I, I'm still a fan of the mass email. I think you should mass email everyone in your contact list. Tell them to start listening. If only one of your friends goes to our site and only one of him pushes the button, we would still get a donation. <clears throat> okay, see, math was never really my strong suit. There's one more piece of business I think we probably should go over. It is May, <gasps> which means the deadline for the Broken Mirror story event uh, has, has ended. And we had more submissions for the, the Broken Mirror event than we did for the October Scary Story event, despite it being much narrower a opening. <clears throat> right. Pretty cool, all the uh, submissions that we got. I was really excited about that. This time around, it wasn't just me and you. We had a whole bunch of people writing stories, which was really cool. I, I was pretty excited to see the uh, response that we got. I, 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 I hate to interrupt you, although I do it every single episode multiple yeah. times. But somebody on another podcast had a story. And you mentioned it to me first. <laughs> it totally fit our Broken Mirror thing. And it was one of those where I thought, whoa, well, hey, right there. This, this, is, this is our premise. Yeah, I thought that was funny, too. So we talked all that time about story ideas that were just like other story ideas that you found out elsewhere. And then all of a sudden, we come up with the whole idea for the event. We come up with our premise. And then somebody has already done the story with our premise. But in the defense of that story... It was during the month of April. Oh, there you up. go. <laughs> you know, as of right now, we haven't really discussed how we're going to go through them and judge them. Are we going to pass it on to our readers, our co-editors, or are we going to do it ourselves or choose one or two people that will read all of them? Or what, what do you think? What's the best way to go through? I think the way that we should do it is have any reader who didn't submit a story be allowed to judge the stories we can send all of them including yours and mine out to them and then they can go through and give them their ratings that first round i think would be to see just exactly where our stories fit in uh, the scheme of things and then uh, after that we would go through and read okay big so morgan freeman dead or alive <laughs> well he's technically alive <laughs> these girls are alive big anklevich is a collector <laughs> 
it's really sad because I put it off and I put it off to the very, very, very last second. And but I, that's what we always do. We've talked about this ad nauseum on the show. But I have like that drawer of ideas in my head and... I come up with an idea and I kind of jumble it around in there. I don't know. It's like uh, you get a rock and you stick it into the rock polisher thing and it bounces around in there and that steadily works off all the jagged edges and then when it comes out you have this nice pretty smooth rock. And that's kind of the way I normally do my stories. I, I kind of work on them in my head for a long time before I ever actually start writing on it. And the idea that I came up with for the Broken Mirror story, you know, I first came up with that idea maybe two months ago or less then we decided to use it for the for the event and i was like yeah i haven't planned this one out enough and so it was really hard for me to get my way through it because i just didn't have it worked out enough in my head i think m maybe it had something to do with that i don't know i just tried my darndest to avoid actually doing this even though i know that there's the deadline looming and i promised that i would do this i'm just like oh I, I have an hour to work on it, but maybe I should just go through my iTunes catalog and add the year that each song was published into the uh, the track uh, info. That would be cool. So I would, you know, oh, I'd find anything. Poor Morgan, man. <laughs> I always do that. I'm always trying to avoid writing, even though I know that when I actually get going, I really enjoy myself doing it. But for some reason, it's I guess it's because it's work. It was a struggle to get it out this time, I'm afraid. How about you? I finished mine on the 26th of April. Really? So I had four days in which to polish that. You, yours is a rock polisher. Mine is more of a ball polisher. You go oh, to the golf I course. Oh, I see. That sounds like you. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. Explicit warning. Oh, no, that's on here already. Yeah, I, I put it off till the 20-something, I think. I had a few ideas that I thought were pretty good. And then I had to choose one. And once I chose that, even though I don't think it's that great of a story, uh, I focused until I got that sucker done. And it wasn't nearly as long as I was afraid it was going to be. So it's not anything like the October Scary oh, Story. So I'll um, survive the reading of it? You may. No guarantees. But Done. Nice work. Congratulations. Thanks, man. Okay, well, do you want to tell us about the plot of the story? On the air? Uh, no, we'll just turn off the microphones and record silence for the next five minutes. Really? No, not really. Although that might be more enjoyable than our usual banter, don't you think? You realize this is my best work, don't you? Sadly, yes. Okay, let's talk about our Broken Mirror stories. You first. Mine was about a young guy, a high school dropout, who goes to this little town of Shamrock, Oklahoma, looking for work. And he gets there, and he's surprised to find that the whole population, all 125 of them, are leprechauns. Real leprechauns? Yes. They migrated from Ireland during the Great Depression and made their home in the central United States. And they know magic and stuff? No, they're just people. Anyway, they kick Gary out. Uh, Gary's the main character. Uh, they kick him out of town for not being a leprechaun, and he continues down the road, hoping his next stop will be a better one. Wow. Pretty neat, huh? No, not at all. Um, Look, I, I, I don't usually criticize your stories. but um, I, I think you usually do criticize my stories. No, 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 you're confusing me with you again. Anyway, I got to say that is uh, not one of your most inspired works, dude. Not when you just tell it in two sentences like that. All right. Okay, Stephen Crane. What was your story about? Well, I, I don't get it. Stephen Crane? He, he wrote Red Badge of Courage. Oh. Well, anyway, mine's the story of Kendall Fleming, who goes to this little rural town along the banks of the Mississippi River in Arkansas. And once he's there, he finds... Rish, that... the Mississippi doesn't go through Arkansas. Oh, uh, I, I meant Arizona. So in town, he's amazed to find that all the women there are between seven and ten months pregnant. And that... Dude. Let me finish. Okay, and there's no men there in town. They're all women. And they're all pregnant. Even the old ones. Even the children. So they kick this guy, Kendall, out because he's not a woman? No. Now who's Stephen Crane, smart guy? That, that doesn't even make sense. So they take Kendall Fleming into the town hall. And, and, and when he comes out... He's eight months pregnant, too. 
finally he has something to look forward to, something to live for. Holy crap, dude. I know. Isn't that awesome? It's awesome how stupid that sounds, even for you. Them's fighting words, man. Yeah, good point, Oedo T. What? What did he say? He said that we're recording this before the deadline has even passed, so what we're talking about is all nonsense. Do you mean you didn't write about a town full of leprechauns? No. That was a joke. A lot less funny than if I had written it, but just a joke. And mine was a joke, too. Was it? Well, you say we have time before the deadline. Right now, yes, but uh, when this actually airs, if it doesn't get edited out for being stupid, no. You know, I think I'm going to write that pregnancy town story. (laughs) That's way too good to just let go like that. You must do what you feel is right, of course. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So uh, next week, maybe we'll talk more about the broken mirror story. Yeah, because by that time, it'll actually be May. We won't be fooling around. (sighs) Anyhow, on the comments page a little while back, we were asking people to share their tips, their suggestions as Uh far as writing goes. And and a lot of people put in websites or books or practices that have helped them. And so I thought maybe we could talk about that uh, right now, if that's okay. Sure. I'm up for that. What you got? Well, a lot of people talk about writers groups. Uh huh. Now, I've been part of a couple of different writers' groups. How about you? I've had my share. Of, uh-huh. So I, I thought it might be kind of cool to talk about writers' groups just for a minute, uh, whether that's helped or whether that's unhelped. Hindered. Hindered. There you go. Thank you. What, was there a rock band called Hinder? Yeah, I think they were the ones that did that. Uh... Warning. This my episode contains... In the next room. Sometimes I wish she was you. I don't know. It's like the lips of the angel. Yeah, the lips of an angel. Sorry. That's what it's called. Lips yeah. of an angel. Hinder. Thanks, droid. Yeah. Um, so what were we talking about? We were talking about writers groups. Yeah. I think on a whole, writers groups are way more help than they are hinder, which is how we got off track. I'm leaving all that in, too. No, you're not. It's too good. The I'm cutting stuff, it out. The hinder stuff is good stuff, man. It's That's terrible. cool. We're talking Parsec Award-winning stuff here. I if they have a special post-story chat Parsec Award. I've found that sharing your stories with other people, it may have its drawbacks, but it's always better than not sharing your stories. Definitely. That's why I want you to share me those stories that you keep trying to hide away and keep from me, and you say no one is allowed to read them. Yeah, I do have stories that are too, I don't know if they're too dear to me or they're too potentially offensive, or I'm just afraid to share them. You're afraid. And they go into a drawer, not your drawer, they go into the (laughs) ball washer, and I never let anybody read them. That's probably not helpful. No, you wrote it. You might as well share it. Would you write it for otherwise? Anyhow, in college, I was in an advanced writing class. Oh. And it was all filled with people who wanted Smart to write. Smart people? Advanced people? No, it was How just like writing 310 or whatever. You know what I mean? So Where there's the 101, 110, 210. What? <laughs> This is the class where the teacher had certain ways that things had to go, and he was really rigid about it. And toward the end of the semester, we started to split up into writers' groups where we had a main story that we were writing for our final, I suppose it was, where we each had a day that we were going to present it. We'd get up and we'd talk about our thing. And the week before that, we were supposed to have passed that story around. And then on our day, everybody would talk about our story because supposedly they had read it. It's something that I found even before it was my turn for story feedback that everybody felt like they weren't doing their part as a writer's group unless they could find something wrong with the story. So it would be really nitpicky stuff. Mm, I don't like the phrasing of the third sentence in the fifth paragraph on page two. Or he's like, oh, you know, I don't think a guy from the South would say wouldn't. You know, he would say ain't or something like that. Or or maybe it would even be more spurious feedback. And, and not to say that these people were worthless, but sometimes they had nothing to contribute. And instead of saying, I really liked your story, or I think you did a good job, or I was moved by this part, or I really laughed on page three, they would say, mm, I, I can't quite put my finger on it, but I think you need to work on the ending or something like that. And just week after week of seeing this, it started to bother me. <laughs> there would be people with legitimate concerns. Yeah. But, what? oh, there was this story, and it was so good. It's the only one, except for my own, uh-huh. that I remember from the class. 
And it was just this wonderful story about prejudice in this little town. And everybody went around the circle and this story was too old fashioned or, you know, I didn't feel that the character was believable or it was like racist people don't talk like that. Or, <laughs> you know, this was a stereotype. And as we were going around the circle, I got madder and madder because this was the best story that had been shared, in my opinion. And so when it came to me <laughs> to give my feedback, I said, your story was great. Don't change a word. Next. <laughs> and, and I could tell that the teacher was irritated by teacher that. Teacher was pissed. He didn't off. Say, take me aside and say, well, "You've been outlining again. It's the second most famous classic blunder. <laughs> What's wrong with you?" But uh, that class taught me that positive feedback is important. That feedback doesn't always have to be negative. And when I moved to L.A. and we were in a, a writer's group, a screenwriting group and things like that, and every single week people would share, I made it a point to always find something good. Even if it was terrible, find something good. Because just as you were saying before, writing is so hard. It's it so much work and it's so much easier to do anything practically. I mean, it's easier to do physical labor than write. Um, easier to dig ditches. <laughs> It is. And there might be some people that are just like, oh, this is so hard. And all they need is somebody to say, you know what? I really loved your story. Or that was so funny. Or I was yeah. spooked by. I find it hard to imagine anyone that could have gone through the beatdown session that sounds like you went through in that class and want to continue. It sounds like it's one of those things where, you know, if everybody's got to find something bad just to be able to have said something, then did you have to hear everybody's comments? Right. Everybody had to have their say. Well, I guess that was how the teacher would determine that you had actually done the work and read the story, is that you shared something in front of the whole class uh -huh. instead of just said pass. But right. uh, that carries over today. Being an editor on the Dune, Steve, every single story that gets sent me, I try and find something good. And I try and say that right out of the boat, that there wasn't a single typo in this whole story, you know, if, if that's the only <laughs> positive feedback I can find. Or this guy's title is really good, whatever it might be. On the positive side, this guy finished. His spell check seemed to be working. That was the worst story that I read. But I tried to start out with something positive because I, I think everybody needs some kind of encouragement. And there would be times when people would share just terrible stuff filled with all sorts of profanity and vulgarity and things that didn't make any sense when they thought that that passed as a story or a screenplay. But it takes courage to share your stuff, too. As I know, having dozens of stories that will never see the light of day you know i always tried to put my all into the reading of the stories doing different voices or you know acting as best i could and then i also tried to encourage and give people stuff that i thought would be helpful because there's such a thing as criticism you know saying something negative about a story with the intention of helping but there's also such a thing as saying oh, what the hell are you even doing writing the, the, the stuff that, that's damning to a, a, a writer's career yeah there's constructive criticism and then there's just criticism you know when you, you attack somebody for nothing other than to hurt them or you tell them hey you want to get this and this fixed because you want the story to be better and usually the best way to give any criticism is like you said couch it in with some positive stuff say oh this part here made me laugh out loud this is really good this part here uh the sentence was confusing even if you have way more bad things to say than good things as long as you say some good things it'll go over a lot better and then that's another thing a comment from one of our listeners abby hilton i believe it was who has submitted a story to us and has also read on the podcast she told a story about how she was working with a uh, writer's group and basically she took everything they said even though you know one person said this thing other person said this thing, other person said this thing. She took all those things, incorporated them in the story, and then tried to get it accepted somewhere. And the person who uh, read the story at wherever it was she'd send it to said, you know, the story is about a thousand words too long, which was about exactly how much longer it was since she put it through the workshop that she'd done it with. And so she said, hey, what about if I send you a, a shorter version? Thought she it sent them... The version. The original before. version, yeah. And they said, oh, yeah, I like that. And so they went with it. And that was her first professional sale. And she apparently learned the lesson that just because somebody says that doesn't mean you have to incorporate it into your story. And the best way is to get a lot of people to comment. And then you can see if more than one person says the same thing, then you know you've really got something you probably ought to work on. Whereas just one person says it, then you can look at it and weigh it and say, yeah, maybe, maybe not. 
you got to remember that you are the writer. You are the one that is most invested in this story. You're the one who has their name on it and knows where it's supposed to go and knows how it's supposed to feel. And if somebody says, you know, I don't think that the dream was scary enough and the dream wasn't supposed to be scary, then that maybe is a suggestion you don't have to follow through. And that, that's one that you can toss out. But rather than hoping to please this teacher or this person by making the dream that was supposed to be funny or titillating or embarrassing, scary, you, you start to deviate from where you want to go with your story. Yeah. It's important to tell the story that you want to tell. I had a story idea that I came up with and I told it to a, a couple of different people and each one of them wanted the ending to be different. Oh yeah, and then you could do this with the end. That would be so funny. At the same time, sometimes people will suggest something and you'll think, wow, I had never thought about that or that's better than where I was going to go. And, and you know, just everybody has different life experience. Everybody has different expectations. One of the stories that I shared with everybody had a particular ending. And I knew that the ending was a sticking point. Whether the ending worked determined whether the story worked or not. And, you know, that can be said for most stories. Yeah. But in a Twilight Zone type story, a horror story, an M. Night Shyamalan, in, in one of those kind of stories, a lot hinges on the ending. And, that, and so I asked everybody, okay, what did you think of the ending? And I got just such disparate responses from people that somebody interpreted it a totally different way than I had intended. I had to think, did I not write the story well? Or was she not paying attention? Or can I look at it and see if it can be interpreted the way that she interpreted it? And if so, well, maybe I need to nudge it a little bit. So, hey, there are a bunch of different ways to do writer's groups. You can do it in your community, get together with friends. You can do it just one-on-one -on -one like you and I do, or email it to your friend, back and forth kind of thing. But there are also some online uh, in the comments. Liz Matchboxky said that uh, there's one that she is part of called the Science Fiction Writers Workshop. It's www.sfwritersworkshop.org. And she's a member of that. And basically, you sign up. Somebody sends out their story to each member every Monday. And you have two weeks to read that story and critique the story and then send it back to the whole group. Basically, you have to critique two stories a month to stay as a functional member. Yeah, I said functional member. This podcast isn't rated explicit for nothing. And then after you've done four critiques, you can submit your work, uh, your story, whatever it is to be critiqued too. And uh, they just send it via email. There's no charge. It's a free thing. It's a bunch of people that are interested in writing. They're serious that want to bounce their work off of others. And she said that it's helped her. That sounds really cool, Ed. One time I did try and join an online writer's workshop where basically you would go to a website. I don't think they do it anymore, so I won't even bother to mention who they are. But you'd go to the website and you'd sign up, say, I want to be in a writer's group. That website would wait until it had seven or eight people. And then it would say, okay, here's a group. Send everybody an email with everybody else's email address. And then you would just start submitting stories. And each week you'd read that story, critique it, send it back. And, you know, that went on. Uh, sadly, I just took stories that I had already written and I steadily sent them out one at a time so I could get comments on them, which is fine. But, you know, I wish it had spurred me on enough at least to write something new. Maybe it was like Abby's deal where these people felt like they had to say something. Luckily, I didn't turn my story topsy-turvy and try to include these people's suggestions because... So much of it was just nitpicky stuff, stupid stuff, some stuff that they would say, oh, you're wrong about this, when I absolutely knew for a fact that I was right and these people were just assuming that they knew and that I didn't. It's important to get writers of similar caliber in your group. I guess it's a pompous thing to say, but you don't want to be the best writer in your group. You want to surround yourself with writers that are as good as you are at the same time let's say that you were in a group and everyone else were published authors who made their living writing full-time that might be tremendously helpful yeah, for i, I think that would be really helpful for the one person who wasn't the published writer but other people probably wouldn't be getting as much great feedback from him when you're writing a story and something goes south you know, something doesn't work do you tend to know that it doesn't work or do you need somebody to say, what were you going for here? Depends. Sometimes you can really feel it when you're writing. You're like, gosh, this just isn't working the way I want it to. And, you know, sometimes you just soldier through it. Then later on, you can go back and fix it in a rewrite. I mean, I guess the most important thing is to keep going. The first draft is not the final draft. It never should be. 
hey, that's helpful for people that are submitting to our podcast too. Unless it's for a contest, e- you know what? Even if it's for a contest, your first draft should not be what you send us at the Dune Steef. Like I said before, it's okay that you spill over a couple of days on the deadline if it means you're going to be able to do a rewrite and fix any mistakes or errors or see that the character names are not consistent or the spelling or the the tense. Oh, gosh. (laughs) I don't know if that bothers you, but to me, this is in present tense and then it becomes past and then it becomes present again. It's so jarring and... You know, there's lots of uh, exercises that you can do. Bosley Gravel, who's submitted to us before, he always puts just in a public forum on his blog or his Facebook or whatever it is, where he's added his story and his progress. And he's got a little bar graph to show how close he is and the work that he does each day. And I emailed him and I said, does that help you to put yourself under a magnifying glass like that in a public forum? And he says, yes. Because there are people that are going to notice if I didn't write the next day when I said I was going to. And, that, and I started to think about that. And for my broken mirror story, granted, it was like two days before I was done. I got one of those little graphs to show how close I was. And I said, OK, and I have till the 30th to finish it. And, you know, a couple of our listeners sent me a good luck. You can go for it kind of emails. And that's helpful, man, to know that you've got a Mick in your corner. Mick as in Burgess Meredith's character in Rocky, not the racial slur, uh, in your corner saying, get him, Rock. Get up, you bum. I need that. Yeah, that sounds really good. I'm going to start that on my blog. Do you have a blog? Maybe I better start a blog, too. Okay. Resolution time. Also, our sometimes show editor, Rick, uh, he suggested one called Write Anything. It's writeanything.wordpress.com. Can we put this stuff in the show notes? Yeah, yeah. They'll all be in the show notes. I'll okay, try cool. and at least make sure to remember that. And that's one that's helped him, and I went to it, and they have essays about writing, and people can comment about what has helped them. The whole website is about writing, and every Friday they have a writing exercise. And it's just like our Broken Mirror event was. They put up a paragraph or a couple of sentences, and everybody is supposed to write on that topic. And I think according to Rick, you could just write for 15 minutes that Friday. You have to set aside 15 minutes to write on their topic. And after that 15 minutes, you call it good. You don't have to finish the story or make a whole story or anything like that. But you're supposed to to share that on the website. Is that that right? Okay, yeah. Like the way that people do comments and people will give them criticism on that or or pointers – We had a couple people mention that our Broken Mirror premise or contest, whatever you want to call it, our event got a lot of people writing and that they they thought about it and they decided that they were going to enter. There was one guy who hadn't written in a long time. Yeah. And he said, you know, you pulled me out of retirement. I became like George Foreman to keep the boxing (laughs) metaphor from a half hour ago. Yeah. So that's good. I'm glad that we were able to help somebody. I certainly wrote a lot. Here at the end of the month, the end of April (laughs) for the podcast. I think it'll be really interesting to see where everybody went story-wise. I know there are lots of websites out there to inspire writers and and maybe as exercises just to get the creative juices flowing or continue you on a creative path. I have to say that it's a good thing that we do these events, I think, because the last story that I wrote was for the October Scary Story event. And now I've written one for Broken Mirror Story event. You said it, Big! And so, again, if there are certain websites that you suggest, put them in the comments. People have been receptive to our conversations about writing, so I'm sure we'll talk about writing again. Yeah. The more comments we get, the more reason we'll have to uh, bring it up. So if you've got something that you like to do that helps you write, drop it into the comments section here, and and we'll try and do uh, some more shows on this in the future. Who knows? Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? Uh, Satan. Oh, okay, I, I will accept that. We also would have accepted <laughs> the so- shadow. We've been talking for a long time. Way too long. So it looks like we've come to the end of our episode. Thank you for joining us. This has been Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anglovich. Keep your distance, but don't look like you're trying to keep your distance. In other words, fly casual. Good night, folks. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them.
take two. I was flipping through the channels today while, during my drive, and almost every station has a droid now. Yeah. Wow. Even, like, good stations have employed a droid. Even if they have a DJ, yeah. a real DJ, who's like, coming up, we've got the new hit from Tiffany, Tiffany. or whoever's, whoever's <laughs> popular today. Yeah, I haven't listened to music since 1987, so I don't know. Coming up, the number one hit from Debbie Gibson's new album. Yet they still employ a droid. Yep. To say, well, I want a girl, Paula Abdul. Oh, good job. So you probably should do it again because I was saying, all I want to do is make love to you, heart. 